Thank you very much. Um, so, um, I'm working at SMHI. Uh, for those of you who live in Sweden, you probably know what it is. For the other ones, it's the Swedish Metrological and Hydrological Institute. So, basically, it's the website to go to when you want to know what the weather will be uh, in the next few hours or the next few days. And uh, of course, because we work with weather, uh, there's a lot of things that we need to do. And my job in particular is to, uh, to work with weather satellite data. But before I go on today, on to this, uh, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a software engineer and uh, now also a research leader at SMHI. And I have a PhD in computer science from the University of Bordeaux. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this university, but at least in France, they are very leading uh, when it comes to free software. And so I was uh, educated into uh, like the only alternative is actually free software. And when I came to Sweden, I got the shock. But anyway, that's another that's another question. So. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a project. Uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, the history of this project, uh, which is called PyTrol. Uh, if you want to know why it's called PyTrol, you can ask me later. Uh, if I finish in advance, you can ask me three questions. Um, so PyTrol is a, is a collection of free and open source software Python packages for processing Earth's observation satellite data. And uh, all the satellite pictures that you will see in these presentations are made with Python. So, um, yeah, it looks pretty nice. And, uh, but I think like 99% of the job is done by the satellites, not by our software. I mean, EOS is just beautiful, so there's no way escaping this. So, a little bit about satellite data. What are we working with, really? Um, so usually when you see satellite data on TV or in the media, you see very nice pictures. Usually they represent the Earth as it would look like if you were in space. Uh, but the truth is actually quite different. Uh, we send more and more satellites which have uh, sensing capabilities which are really different from the human eye. So here is an example of a, of a satellite which is stationed over uh, America. When I say America, it's North and South America, not just the US. And um, uh, basically it senses in different wavelengths, uh, different frequency bands, uh, meaning that it measures in the infrared, it can also measure in the ultraviolet, it can also measure in the visible uh, frequency bands. So you have a lot of different narrow pieces of the spectrum that you can look at. And those pieces of the spectrum are very interesting because they're really they, they, uh, they provide different insights on different aspects of the atmosphere at this moment, which is something which the meteorologists or the system they are using are, are interested in. Um, so, for example, if we combine different of these frequencies together, we can have an image that looks a bit like this. And you would, uh, I mean, an acute observer will say, mm, this shouldn't really look like this, right? Uh, here, basically, the snow is in uh, yellow and orange, and that's because we decided to pick those channels and visualize them in a way that would show us the snow. And the yellow snow is the one that is fresh, and the orange snow is the one that is melting. And this is very interesting in uh, a different kind of uh, uh, situations. So, now you know everything about satellite data, right? <laughs> Um, so our software, PyTrol, uh, the project that we're working on, uh, is done for reading, processing, saving the data. We support more than 90 satellite data formats. I talked with some of you uh, during the lunch break. Basically, every time there's a new satellite, there's a new data format. Because for some reason, they cannot agree uh, on what should be, <laughs> what they should use. So anyway, every time there's a new satellite coming up, we need to add new code in order to, uh, to support the, the satellites so that we are able to read the data. And we also added support for remote files because more and more things are in the cloud and you don't really want to download things. Maybe you just want a small piece of the data. So if we support remote reading of files, then we can, uh, we can do this much more effectively. 
Uh, composites, we call composites it's like images, so we have a lot of different combinations on the channels to show different features and corrections, and we can save the proper image uh, GIS in data formats. Yeah, about standards. Okay? Um, you know what I mean. Uh, things that we implement, scientific algorithms, that's an example, it's called uh, Rayleigh uh, Scattering Correction. So basically, you try to remove the effect of the sky when you look through it, and that makes it uh, more pleasing to the public usually. Uh, another problem we have is resampling, so if you have uh, your data in a given grid of pixels and you want to change the projection or anything, then you need to, to choose which pixel matches which pixel in the, in the destination which for example, here you have different projections of the same image, so it's a complex topic. There are a lot of complex things, uh, very scientific and everything, so it's quite a lot of work. And last thing, but not the least, is that it needs to run operationally. I mean, our customers, they are expecting the data to come 24-7. We need to move files around, we process many gigabytes of data, and we need to generate images scientific products all the time, it should be near real time. If you wait like one hour after the, after the data arrives, it's already too late because the weather has gone to something else. So, yeah, quite hard, uh, uh, quite hard uh, things that we need to work on. So, now that you know all this, let's go back to the beginning. Where did we start? So I started working at the Semi-Chai in 2009. And um, the situation was like this when I arrived in, in my office. So uh, this is the top part of the SMHI. We had an old processing software which was created by a consultant, but it was way too complex to understand it. So we could not upgrade it, so we didn't know where it was. We had the source code and everything, so that was fine, but it was really, really complex. So, uh, and we also had then uh, my colleague who I work uh, closest with nowadays, he had started making some uh, scripts for the newer satellites and uh, it was um, based on the byproducts of another software in order to get the data that he was interested in and so on and so forth. So we had to do something about this. And we also had colleagues at DMI. DMI is the Danish Meteorological Institute. Um, and I, from what I understand, they were using the two med software, so this is a proprietary software, commercial, closed source. And it had limited capabilities, so they started working on a small project on their own, because they wanted to make this easier to use. Um, so that's what we had at the time, and then trying to think of the alternatives. Was there any other solution? Was there anything else we could have done? So one of the alternatives was commercial software. I mentioned that uh, DMI was using this. There are other, uh, a couple of others, um, but they are usually quite expensive. I'm, I'm not an IT management person, so I don't know how things are expensive usually, but I think this is pretty expensive. I just called, I talked to a colleague this morning, and he said basically the yearly license for one software running this uh, operationally would cost 70 thousand euros per year, which I think is pretty expensive. I mean, you could hire one person to work for that price, uh, full time. It was closed source, of course. Uh, you had some configuration files, so you can tweak a few things, but not so much. And uh, what we need, basically, is flexibility, adaptability, because we have a lot of customers, they all want different things. Uh, you want to be able to adapt quickly when there are new satellites, because, of course, the people producing this software, uh, one of the software, for example, was just run by a couple, and basically the guy was programming and the woman was uh, uh, doing the uh, marketing. And yeah, it, it took quite some time before you had updates for new satellite missions and everything. So it was not really sustainable. Another alternative is that, uh, I don't know how it was in 2009, I cannot say about this, but this I noticed a few years back. Then there are open source software available for satellite processing. But it's very limited in the scope, so it's basically, uh, for example, the European Space Agency launches a new satellite and they decide to try to, uh, to write just a small program to process this data. It's very limited because it just works on this satellite 
And basically, they have money for like six months, so they hire a couple of developers for six months, they create the software, and when the project is over, well, they don't have any money, so nobody's retaining this anymore. And technical debt and the documentation issues make it so that the money can take over and, and work with this, uh, which is a pity. So we have to do something about that, right? We could not stay in this situation. So basically, we have a meeting. Uh, Myself, one of my colleagues at the SMHI, and then three colleagues from DMI, all software developers. So it was a low level meeting, so, so to say, or a secret meeting maybe. Um, and we started exchanging code for that point on. And uh, we had a few things to generate some images, and they had some things to do this projection, to change the projection, to, to the cartographic projections. And we decided to go from the start with the GPL v3 when possible and LGPL otherwise. And we didn't have any funding. So we were just developing this because we needed it in our job. Uh, but there was no explicit money saying, okay, you should work on this for that much time. So, and it's still the case today. Uh, most of the people that are working on Python they don't have any specific funding. It's just that they use it in their jobs and then they make it better because they think it's a, it's a good thing. So, that was in 2009, and I said it's SMHI and DMI, and we run like this for a couple of years, um, but we understood, basically from the meetings we had with other agencies, um, NMS means National Med Service, so other countries around Europe started to be interested in this small scripts, small programs that we have, um, so we decided in 2012 to have a small workshop. Um, it was not so big, it was I think just like three days. We invited people to SMHI, we told them, okay, uh, we're going to have three days where we show you what we have been doing for, for those couple last years and maybe it's something that is of interest to you. And I expected maybe two people to show up. But there were actually like 15 persons coming and I was really, really happy. So. Uh, several national health services uh, sent some representatives, and we even had UMEDSAT. So, you probably don't know what UMEDSAT is. Basically, it's the European organization which is coordinating all the weather satellites. Uh, so, they are financed by the European taxpayers. Uh, it's a European organization. So, um, so, and what we have now, basically, after we did this, so, for a few years, the adoption is quite good, I think. All the blue countries here are actually using Python in operations in their national med service. Um, and that's most of the people we know. Okay, it's open source, so you don't actually track anyone, or actually we don't. So we don't know who is actually downloading our software and using it in operations, but from talking to people at conferences and things like this, we, we, know, we know approximately who, uh, who is doing this. But how do you adopt free software? Management usually they won't guarantee. So we had a few people talking to us, developers and other services. They told us, yeah, it's it's really great software, we really want to use it, but our management they don't want to because there is no support. They don't have anyone to call in the middle of the night if something is going wrong. Huh, how do you how do you deal with that? I mean we're just a bunch of programmers doing things together, we didn't have any support for that, we didn't have any companies behind us. How do you do this? Well, what we came up with was actually to have a memorandum of understanding. So those countries which were already using Python operationally, they signed a paper together saying, okay, we are engaged in this project, we, on the best effort basis, we will help each other as much as we can, and uh, that helped quite a lot. I would say we had, from the moment we had this memorandum of understanding, we went from five countries to maybe 10, 15 countries adopting this. So this is really good. We also have something called the Pytrol Tax. Uh, I don't know if it really fits in this talk, but I just wanted to mention it here that uh, for some things, for this project, because we don't have any funding, uh, we created a, a small uh, tax, so people, like different national med services, they pay maybe like 200 euros a year, which is like peanuts for them. 
Uh, but for us it helps us have some paid services like Stack that we use a lot. Uh, we can also buy some merch, so when we go to uh, conferences we can distribute it and people are happy and yeah, spread the word. So that's that's pretty cool. Nice images, right? Alright, oh that's that's the image here, it's Norshopping. So Norshopping is the city in the eastern coast of Sweden where the main uh, building of uh, SMHI is, is situated and I think uh, SMHI is around here somewhere. So um, yeah, that was in, uh, in February. No, sorry, what am I saying? It was like uh, like three weeks ago or something like that. Still quite some stuff. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the adoption at HumanSat because now I talked about the other words of services and that was fine. They they went with the memorandum of understanding, so that was that was quite okay. HumanSat was another uh, battle. Uh, it's not finished yet. Uh, it's a European organization, so they have some very picky lawyers. Uh, they have uh, this policy that they should not be competing with European businesses. So they felt, at least a lot of people at QMSAT felt that if they were contributing to our open source project, they would, they would be competing with local companies. Uh, so that was a bit of a, of a nightmare. But it's funded by the European taxpayers, so why not use open source? But nowadays, they're actually contributing and promoting. So it started by having a few people that were coming to our workshops that we had uh, regularly. And um, internally they were using PyTool because it turns out that PyTool was actually quite good. And it was using them a lot for what they were doing the, the job like looking at satellite data, making sure that it was correct, that it was calibrated correctly and that everything was working properly. So nowadays it, they're actually um, uh, contributing, promoting. So, uh, there is a new set, there are a couple of new satellite missions which are coming up. Um, one satellite, a new generation of Metosat that you probably heard about, uh, which is a geostationary satellite above Europe. It's coming now, it's going to be really great. I mean, uh, new generation, very good things. And in the documentation of the formats for the user, they say if you want to work with this data, we recommend using Python. So that's really cool. The community, let's see, two minutes. The community that we that we are now actually, uh, do we have a community? Yeah, I think we do. Uh, PyTool is used operationally in many institutes. I showed that, I showed, showed that before for Europe. Uh, North and South America also. Uh, I know there are also people in other continents using PyTool, but I don't have any idea if they actually use it operationally or if it's just uh, temporary. But I think in Australia and uh, probably in China, Japan, some people are using it. We have an active community. You can see here this is a plot that was made by a <coughs> website, I think it's called OpenHub. And basically it shows the amount of contributors per month, and you can see it's going up basically yeah, for this. So we have quite many contributions, we're really happy about that. Our users are national med services, researchers, this is very important. Uh, researchers, they have uh, a very important role because they uh, they make sure that the data, satellite data, is being uh, understood, deployed, and so on and so forth. So um, very very good to have them. We have commercial companies nowadays which are starting to use Python, which is really nice. In some ways, in other ways, some companies don't get it. Um, they, they we, we, there's a company which is using one of our uh, national med services in Europe, and they use they, they they took everything they made the release so that it can run for for these customers, and they come every year to the hackathons that we have and they say yeah yeah we have a lot of new things that we want to contribute and I think it's been five years I never saw this. Um, and we have enthusiasts, like amateurs, you know, people who have a small antenna on their balcony and then they get some satellite data and they want to process it, so that's really cool. Uh, they have way too much time on their hands. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's people retired, 
and they uh, like ask many questions every day, and we're like, oh, we, I don't have time to. <laughs> But it, most of the time they solve the problems by themselves because they have so much time, so it's good. And yeah, I said research, quite important. There are quite a few articles being published every, every year using PyTool. Uh, we have very high quality data processing. We're really proud of this. We have a lot of eyes, of course, looking at this. It's open source software, so uh, as soon as there's a problem, someone will probably spot it. It's reproducible, so every time you run it, and you, make, you can be sure that you get the same results. We actually publish the different versions of, of our software on Zenodo, for example, so you have a DOI, so you can cite it, so people who are looking at your work and download the same version and rerun it and say. It's reliable, so it doesn't crash that much. I think we have very high reliability and scores. It's traceable, and it's good for orbit science. And uh, yeah, I think that's my last slide, how we thrive. Yeah, we have a community chat, community mail, and that is quite active, that's very nice. Uh, people ask a lot of questions, we try to answer as much as we can. People answer each other, which is really great. We have bi-yearly hackathons, which means that uh, once a year we meet all of us, all, all of those that want to, and uh, we meet for a week and then we decide on the problems that we're going to work on and then we just hack and have them together. Uh, and the other time of the year, I say by yearly, the other time of the year we decided now to have it remotely because some people cannot afford to go to the venue. So it's also a good thing to democratize it if we have it online once a year. So that's what we do. And we try to keep high coding standards, so we use clean code as much as we can. We have a lot of testing different things, uh, documentation, and that we try to keep up to date all the time. And that was my last time. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thanks a lot, uh, Martin. That was uh, very interesting. <coughs> Sorry. So, do you have uh, any questions for Martin? That's all I'm left. So, what sort of data formats do the satellites send in? I guess images, but there's also more processing done on the satellites? Um, usually they do not send images. Uh, it's usually... Um, so, it, it's, it's a bit complicated, basically, the, uh, for efficiency reasons, because they have such limited resources, both in bandwidth, but also in processing power. So uh, the data is sent highly compressed and you know uh, interlaced and everything down to Earth. And then on Earth you have uh, pre-processing software if you want that turns this jumble of, of binary data into something which is usually NetCDF or HDF formats, but it's it's like scientific uh, data formats. And from there that's where PyTool comes in, takes these data formats. Uh, different frequencies, put them together so that we have nice images, for example. Okay, do I have another question? I'm here the rest of the day, so don't hesitate to come talk to me during the coffee break. So. Why is it Yeah, why is it not <laughs> Ah, very good question. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, we had to decide at one point how we would call this thing that we we're working on. We didn't really know, but it was uh, basically, as I said, started by Denmark and Sweden. So we wanted something Nordic. Uh, we thought about a few things like Vikings, and we thought, yeah, that, that's a bit pretentious. Pytanos, yeah, you know, Pytanos are great, but I don't know if we really want to call the project like this. Uh, so we decided, yeah, Pytroll, because trolls, they are Nordic creatures that are, yeah, a bit stupid, like our software, we didn't want it to be too intelligent, we just wanted to keep it simple and stupid. And, but they're nice, usually, so, at least in the Nordic folklore. So. Okay, great. So, great. Thanks a lot, Mati. And yeah, so we will have a two-minute break to switch laptops and then continue this procurement. <laughs> See you